Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. In the studio is actress Katrina Carlson and author Dan Fonte. Katrina Carlson has worked in theater, television, and film. She was the youngest of 11 children, was born and raised in Scottsdale, Arizona. She went on to attend Brown University, where she studied international relations, <laughs> foreign policy, and diplomacy. Her interest in politics took her to Washington, D.C. Did that last very long, Katrina? Uh, well, no, not really. I, I think um, I was working for Senator DeConcini at the time of the Keating uh, little <laughs> <laughs> event, and um, whereas I really always thought of um, Dennis as being a, a real, like, kind of not the charismatic Reagan type who was in office at the time, but, but a really good guy who was honest and hardworking, which he is, but at the time it was just, it really shattered my uh, dreams, I guess, of, of what I thought politics could be. That whole so scandal good. about giving yes. and taking money and <coughs> deregulating. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, I was there as an idealist. You know, I really wanted to make a difference, and I realized that in so many ways, you know, maybe it's just better to be out of public office and do things else. Did you elsewhere. Did you know the senator from Arizona? Was he friends of your family? Um, indirectly, yeah, but it was just through you know applying as an internship and you know sort of hard work getting in there to work for him. So. Through your own. Uh, <laughs> Ideal. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, which is not to say that politics is not something that one should uh, seek if if that is what one's interested in. Right. So, There's yeah, but there are different ways for everyone, and that was not for me. And well, I realized life was too short. But you were there a long time. Well, um, actually, I was in. I was there for a while, but I wasn't working for the senator the whole time. I wasn't working on the hill. Then I left, and I started um, in the Washington D.C. theater circuit. Is what I started. Oh, doing you then. did. Yes, I did. I started working there. So, so acting so. did come into play Absolutely. in Washington. I, th I was wondering if uh, you were doing things on the side while you were still working in politics. I was doing things on the side, and then I just said uh, I cut off the politics and started uh, just doing more of the acting. Then. Well. Uh, I think the acting probably came naturally, coming from a big Catholic family. <laughs> I think you, you probably all could be on stage at the same time and read every role in a play. Yeah, it was a constant endeavor <laughs> to sort of like bring attention to yourself in a family of 11. I was the youngest, so I did get some attention, but it was definitely uh, whatever you could do to bring the limelight to you, to be noticed out of the 11. So um, Were they I, on stage too? Well, we, we had a little <laughs> Christmas play every year that we used to do at our house, and um, you know, I started out as baby. Jesus, and then made my way up to uh, drummer boy, and then. Uh, did you? Did, were you married at one point? I oh, hope. Oh yeah, I'm sure I was married. I hope you were married. <laughs> you have to. You have to go all the way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, then your acting actually continued while you went to Brown. That's correct. Yeah, I, I was in a singing group the whole time. When I was there, my first week before school even started, I think I auditioned for like six different performing arts things, and I got into about five of them, and sort uh -huh. of carried them through for the five years between uh, singing groups and uh, different plays and things. Well. well you sang before you acted then? Yes, I did. I really was. I originally, I, I, I sort of started as a singer. That's, um, I was in musicals, and um, that's sort of ah. what got me interested in the acting part. But, but you also wrote. You I, are, yes, you write, I, yes, I'm do. a songwriter as well. And I got into that more in like uh, around 20. I started trying my hand at songwriting. I had tried before then, but I never quite like completed the songs. And then I started really making a concerted effort and learning about what it is to be a songwriter, what it, you know. The, did just, you take it, singing lessons? I absolutely did, yeah. And also how to write songwriting. Yes, I, I, I know studied, you have yeah. to learn how to write a song, right? Absolutely. And <laughs> I mean, you know, you learn and then you want to <laughs> unlearn it because then, you know, the creativity is when it comes into play. You can, you can sort of over know the formula. You know? Well, that's what I was wondering because mm -hmm. you always have to have a bridge. You always have yes, to have yes, a chorus. You, have, to, you yeah. have to have for, certain for tunes, parts, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do you still? I mean, do I, you I mean, feel I, you I need work those in that things? framework sometimes. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of times, you know, A and R people they want to see that. They want to see that. They want to 
say, don't bore us, get to the chorus. You know? Oh, because so, you can do that's the hook. certain... <laughs> yeah, that's what gets people drawn into your song. So there are, you should definitely know the fundamentals and then sort of throw them out the window, but you know, oftentimes you have to go back to them and, and well, do that. When did the serious career change come about after school and after the hill? Yeah, well, it's funny. It was always something I wanted to do and I was like pushing it back and pushing it back. And I think that when I had a death in my family, I, um, I said, you know, life is too short. I have to do what I want to do, what I really want to do, what I do with all my spare time, what I do whenever I have a chance outside of this serious, you know, education and work that I did do was it was theater, it was the arts, it was writing, it was singing. So I just said, forget it, life's too short, I'm going to do it no matter what that just means for my life. Just do it full life. time, mm -hmm. do Absolutely. it full time because you were I'll always doing it. I commit myself to that, yeah, because, and that was the thing that brought me happiness, inner happiness, and I knew that was what was important to follow was my heart, and that was it. But where did you have to follow it? Did you have to come here? To yeah, Los we did. We did. <laughs> I don't know, it wasn't so bad for me. I was back east for, you know, I was born and raised in Phoenix, in Scottsdale, and at 17 I went back to Brown. Um, it was with oh. not knowing a soul. Um, um, didn't know a person who went there. I was out of my element there, and I lived in New York City. Went to Manhattan School of Music, and oh, you did? Yes, I did. I studied classically opera, et cetera, and then I was in Washington D.C. So moving to the West Coast actually was sort of like moving home for me. Well, when you were in the East, did you do any Broadway? I did off Broadway at the Sargent you Theater did. there. Yes, I did. In I was singing in or acting? Both. It was a, it was a musical, dancing as well. Because singing, when I dancing. looked at your resume, there was so much theater on it. Yeah. I, I mean, is that that's your first yeah, love? Yeah, that's my first love, theater. And that's how you, I mean, you know, generally, and I, I don't know, I just was never in a place where there was a, a television or film hub. So what you oh, do is theater, right, you know, right. and that's what I've always done is theater. And in Phoenix, there was no real television or anything. So even as a kid, you know, I would do theater and Annie and Grease and whatever I could get my hands on. <laughs> but that really... Um, I think actors always say that the um, having an audience makes such a difference. Does that yes, matter to you? Yes, it does. It really is something that you can work off of and it gives you that energy and there's always that possibility, you know, of something very spontaneous happening. There's always, you know, there's always something every night. So it's it's exciting. It gets your adrenaline pumping because you just don't know and you don't have take two or take three or anything. Well, that's what I, I always wondered. Yeah. I always thought, well, you're on the stage. You're there. If you make a mistake, you've made a mistake. This is terrible. At least if you're in film <laughs> or television, you can go back and redo yeah, it. Yeah, it seems that way. Yes, it does. Unless you're on a low budget film, in which case you better get it the first time because they don't have time. And so, talking about low yeah. budget. <laughs> yeah. it, it, you, you just um, had a role, a supporting role in a really terrific yeah. film called oh. Special Delivery. Yeah. Um, tell us about it. Well, I'm just very proud of this film. It was um, written and um, produced and directed by my husband, Ken Carlson, and it was a, a sort of a, a project, like I said, it's our third child because, you know, he's been working on it since we, before we had our first child, and now our first is three years old, and we've just, he's just wrapped that film. And um, anyways, it's just a beautiful film with a beautiful message, and I'm just very proud to be a part of it, and it, it sort of exceeded our expectations. We got wonderful actors, Sean Young, Penny Marshall, uh, Nell Carter, uh, Paul Dooley, Jerry Burns. It just goes on and on. Oh, the people that we have in that film, the people that believed in it, it's just incredible and it's just sort of like a spiritual thing. We're it, just very it blessed. Seemed, it. it seemed like that. I mm -hmm. saw the film and I thought it was so, it moved. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think, and it moved you. And it mm -hmm. was clean and nice um, and something that you could identify yeah. with. And it was fantasy. It had everything going for it. Uh, and you had a terrific role in it. So we have a clip of that. Oh, Do you want to set that clip up for us? Oh, sure. Um, okay. I, I am sort of Sh uh, Sean Young's assistant in the law firm. And um, she had, she's been told, I don't want to, well, she's been told by an angel that she's going to give birth to the, well, that she's had an immaculate conception. She's going to give birth to some kind of child of God. And um, she is sort of like, not me, I'm a lawyer. You've got the wrong girl here. She's a mother of three. And, and um, because of that, and because she's had to admit that publicly, her law firm has fired her when she's just been promoted to be a partner, a senior partner, a managing uh. partner. And um, so now I'm in the firm, and she's packing up to say uh, she's leaving the, the, the firm. And I'm very disappointed. So. And you're in this... Uh, is that point. This is this that is point right where she's packing point. up and I'm sort of helping her All out right, there. We'll see that now. Okay. Thanks. Are, are you sure there's nothing I can do? Threaten somebody? Lose all their files? Erase their hard drive? <laughs> 
Make sure they follow through with the Galligan case. Don't let them drop the ball. Consider it done, counsel. I know I didn't exactly go out of my way to make friends around here. You were too busy working. Keep in touch. I'll call you. I really mean it. I do too. Matherson's office. <clears throat> William? Um, no, she's not here. All right, I'll let her know. Okay. Bye. He said you can reach him at home. Any day of the week. That was good. Um, Lying for you. your friend. Yes, I know. Right, exactly, exactly. Yes. She, she Don't sort we of... do that? Just a little white lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was definitely the faithful servant to her, so that was great. Um, besides being in this movie, you mm -hmm. were you wrote some of the music. Yes, I did. I did. So the end title credit has my uh, has a song I wrote called "I Never Believed." And um, also, there's a song in a montage there as well. And so, I mean, I made the cut. It was it was some fierce competition. Well, I really had to prove myself. Yeah, there were some other uh, tunes from some other artists, and uh, um, so I was just very happy to get in there as well. You didn't so. sing it, did you? Yes, I did. I sang both of oh, them. Oh, you sang yeah. it yes, too. Yes, I did. I sang it too. Oh, yeah. that's fabulous. Yeah. Well, it's, it was just wonderful for me to have that opportunity and, and I enjoy doing it and I got a really positive response from it so that's really great. Well we're so, really... Yeah, we I'm were working on a CD now and I'll <laughs> let you know. Are you? <laughs> yes I am. Well I'm, a compilation of Yes what? of just tunes that I've been writing for the past 10 years you know but yet more uh, some that I'm working on now of course but uh, working on that and just getting a demo out there so that... I'd love you know, to gets, hear an album of Broadway show tunes because oh. your voice sounds like it could really wow. handle that. Yes, it is. Yeah, it can. And that is my forte. I mean, like I said, I, I, I sang <laughs> opera. I can go, I run the gamut. I've studied it all. So uh, I'm a student as well as an <laughs> artist. You know, You'll so. bring it back to us. I will. I will. Back. I would love to. Okay. I would love to. Thank you very much. And thank you very Great. much, Katrina Carlson. And don't go away because Dan Fonte will be on next. We'll see you in a minute. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with author Dan Fonte. Dan is a native Californian, the son of Los Angeles novelist and screenwriter John Fonte. Dan has his first novel, Chump Change, and I'm going to hold it up here so you can see it, just published, and his first full-length play, Boiler Room, produced on stage. I hate to ask this, but what have you been doing in the meantime? <laughs> what took you so long to get here? Uh, you know, um, I'll, I'll give you the simple answer that um, drugs and alcohol played a, a very uh, big part in my life for a long time. And uh, about 12 years ago, that all came to an end, and I began to... <clears throat> With the help of uh, with the help of a of a twelve step program, I began to appreciate um, my legacy as a writer, and I began to write myself. and uh, And from it have come uh, this wonderful play, Boiler Room, which is uh, you know which has gotten great reviews, and also uh, my first novel, Chump Change, which is now in the stores too. But it took you so long. Were you writing before? No. I mean, talk about no. drugs and alcohol, but no. in between, were you writing? No, no. I uh, the from I began writing about eight or nine years ago. Oh, you actually with a father who was writing all yeah. the time, yeah. who had so much renown. You never. I was a drunk, Joan, for, <laughs> for about twenty-five years. So I had, I had, I was otherwise occupied. I see you were otherwise occupied. There's a list. Uh -oh, of things wonderful. that you did here in the back, window washer, taxi driver, salesman, telemarketer, private investigator, night hotel manager, um, carnival barker, you're kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Where did you do all these things? Envelope stuffer, that I can see. 
<laughs> Where did you do all of uh, those well, things? Well, I did, uh, between New York and Los Angeles, I had a lot of jobs because when you're, um, when you're moving around uh, and, you're, um, and you don't want to take anything from an employer, you, you quit a lot of jobs or get fired from a lot of jobs. So I've, I've had a lot of jobs. But basically, uh, I was a cab driver in New York for seven years where I got a lot of experience in, uh, um, for my second novel, which, is, uh, which will be out in France um, in early 99, which is called Spitting Off Tall Buildings. So what you, got, you have a lot of information from all these jobs. So actually, those things were a writer's dream, yeah. really. Yeah, I, Joan, I write autobiographical fiction. What that is is it's first-person fiction, like uh, um, my, the, my character is named Bruno Dante, and he talks about what it was like and what he's going through. Chump Change is, a, is three weeks in the life of a guy that returns from a recovery home mm. in New York City to Los Angeles to be at the deathbed of his father. I see. Who is a, see. a screenwriter, novelist, as my dad was. I see. So I it's see. A autobiographical fiction. I want to talk about Chump Change because I heard a reading that you gave at a local bookstore, and I know you, you are giving readings, or um, I guess giving yeah. readings, yeah. Uh, at bookstores all over the country and all over the state. So I think people should look for you um, and Chump Change. But besides that, um, it seems to me that you would have, I, I still keep going back to this. Did you go to college? No. Oh, you didn't go to college? Well, for a while. I, I, you know, Tell I, me a little I bit about, flunked your, out of college. Ab about your education, because um, all of this leads up to your writing abilities, I think. Well, I, w uh, you know, I was not a rocket to stardom uh, in, in education. I, uh, I'm, I guess what you'd call a late bloomer uh, in, in the sense that uh, as a kid, I was always ambitious, but I was very fragmented, and I spent a lot of time alone. And uh, as a young guy, um, I drove a cab, as I said, in New York for seven years. Well, where'd you go to school? I went Basic to, school. I went to Santa Monica. I went to Santa um, Monica College for a year, I see. and then I went to a, a school called Saint Monica's High School here in Santa Monica. I know Saint Monica's. So that's where you started, and you went to elementary school here yeah, in California yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. I see. I grew up in Malibu. And I went see. to uh, Lincoln Junior High School in St. Monica's I High see. School. I yeah. see, I see, I see. So, um, and when then I hitchhiked to New York uh, when I was 19 um, um, and stayed in New York for 12 or 14 years. Did you come from a large family? No, I'm the second of four. Uh, of four kids. Well, four kids is pretty big. <laughs> uh, Catholic, uh, you know, uh, 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 an Italian. Uh, my dad is Italian American. My mom is uh, English German, and they're. Uh, uh, and uh, his, my dad's family had four, and my mother's family had two. I guess four is pretty, is, pretty yeah, big. Yeah. So is Fon Fonte's Italian? Yeah, yeah. Fanti, actually, my Fanti? dad. My dad would say Fanti. Uh, or Fant is what you know. Yeah, most people look yeah. at it. And well, the Fanti. French say Fonte. Mm -hmm. So uh, somehow it's be, it's evolved. To, it could be a French name or an Italian. Well, now that you've mentioned France and we've gotten to France, we can go on to the next thing. You never could get this book published that's, here. Yeah, that's right. So Chump that's Change right. could, was published in France. You've done your homework, Joan, yeah. Give, give yeah. us the roundabout. What, um, well, it, my book got very good reviews, and uh, but it took four years to get it published, and it was not published here. I had to, my dad, John Fonte, sells very well in France. A friend of oh. his, uh, oh, sorry, a man who knew his work came to Los Angeles doing a television documentary on my father for French TV. And I was um, managing a hotel at night and he came and wanted to talk to me and I gave him a manuscript. And after I gave him the manuscript, he took it to France, to back to Paris with him and he <coughs> got it published. And that was chump change. And that then, was just by coincidence. Just by coincidence. By accident, they just came. Just by coincidence. And <laughs> and they had they actually believed in you enough because they obviously yeah. were great fans of your father's writing, yes. or they yeah. wouldn't have been making a yeah. documentary yeah. and spending the time. But on you it. know, this kind of speaks to the condition of publishing in, in in America because it's real tough to get autobiographical fiction uh, uh, now published in here and this is a good book I mean it's got decent reviews even even if I say so myself but it was turned down by I don't know 30 or 40 American publishers and 
even having been published in France, it had to go to England, mm. and a friend of mine in England read it and sent it to an American publisher. And that's how it got. <laughs> that's how it got here? published. Tell me, tell me what 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 really happens. Why do you write autobiographical fiction? Why don't you just write it in the first? Person. Well, the first person is autobiographical fiction, but... Oh, uh, I mean, I know you're writing in the first person, but why don't you just put your name on it? Is there a reason for oh, that? Oh, yes, because it's fiction. Because it, it is, perhaps, the plot, uh, segments of the plot are based on fact, but it is fictionalized. Oh, I see. So, uh, uh, for instance, this book takes place in a three-week span uh -huh. in the book. Uh -huh. in, in actual fact, it took place over 12 or 14 years in oh, my life. Oh, I see. So you, so you, the facts are there, or the subject matter is there, but you just manipulate the time yeah. and the place. Yeah, that's right. That type yeah, that's of thing, right. is that that's it? That's right. I, is, uh, my thought is that, you know, I couldn't go through all the, uh, all the, the jails and suicide attempts and all that. Uh, what, what I did do, uh, is capsulize it, in, as I said, into a 21-day period in December. It takes place around the holidays oh, at where um, uh, my character, Bruno Dante, his father is dying, and he has not made, he's not resolved his relationship with his oh, dad. And so he comes, uh, he returns to Los Angeles to be at the deathbed of his father, oh, and he comes out of a recovery home uh -oh. and a suicide attempt. So this is <laughs> Uh, that distinction, uh, it, you know, it's based on fact, but it is fiction. So, so I, I understand. I don't want to get in trouble and no, say, no. you know, and say that, uh, and say that it's factual because it's not. No, I understand now. I understand the, the way it's done. I couldn't understand it before. But if, um, since it took you so long, do you think that it took you a long time to write because you were intimidated by the fame of your father? It's a very good question. Uh, the, I never wanted. Um, it, it always took too long to write, and I was more of an instant gratification mm -hmm. kind. My gag is that the only problem with instant gratification is it's not fast enough. It's not fast enough, even and, that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so what happened is, uh, no, I never, uh, I never really pursued it seriously, and then I got sober, and I began to look at my life and, uh, I, and I really had the time to pick a direction. I didn't, I had the luxury of being able to choose. And I decided to sit down and write something. It took me four years to write that book. Oh, it took you four years. The other, I know Bukowski was a great friend of the family. Yeah. Are these, wor these words, I shouldn't ask are they, the words to me seem very Bukowski-ish, very strong, very, uh, like not afraid to say what well, you want to say. There's a similarity between between Bukowski, but my my uh, literary mentor was uh, and is Hubert Selby Jr., oh, who is who a, also, but he, a wonderful writer. Different. Great that last exit to Brooklyn is a great is a great book. Bukowski had an influence on me, but honestly, I would say Selby and John Fonte had the the strongest influences on me as a writer. You know, mm -hmm. and people compare this. Uh, people have compared my work, uh, uh, actually, even a, as a cross between the two, between Bukowski and and uh, and and John Fonte. Well, when I heard you read, I I felt some of that coming out, and of course I, I I, I forgot about Selby, but that's exactly nice. yeah, that's exactly right. Do you have the luxury now to sit down? You wrote a second novel. Was it a luxurious time for you? I mean, in the fact that you didn't have to worry about another job, you could just sit down and write? It's very interesting. Uh, it took me four years, and I learned how to okay. write a novel by writing this. And the relief of being done with this, I wrote my play, Boiler Room, which oh, right. uh, which got such wonderful reviews, has been getting such wonderful reviews, and I it took four years to write the novel, and then it took six months to write the play. Then, <laughs> I, well, I guess I wasn't uncomfortable enough, so I sat down and spent another year writing my second novel, Spitting Off Tall Buildings. So, so that came pretty that fast. That came very fast. Yeah. I think there's a, a quote from your father about sitting down and having to type a word and worrying that I'm not going to get the first word. I, I read yes. it the other day, not get the first word on, and then once the second word gets on, is that going to be right? And he builds himself up in this quote where finally he <laughs> blows on his fingers and then starts because yes. he's really yes. made himself want to go. Fact, 
Because that at the, was... <laughs> at the end of one of his, I think it's Dreams from Bunker Hill, uh, he said, um, he, he, he says, the writer says, he sat down and began to write, the time has come, the walrus said, to oh. speak of many things, of shoes and ships and right. sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and then his next line, it wasn't mine, but it was a good start. It was a good start, and he was <laughs> obviously really concerned about starts yeah. And, yeah. and doing things. He won, did he win an Academy Award? He was, he, no, he or wrote he was some, nominated? he was nominated uh, and, and was, did a number of big, you know, well-received films. The thing about my dad as a, as a novelist, he was able to pick it up toward the end of his screenwriting career, uh -huh. and uh, he had a hard time getting started. But once he got started, he could do a book. That's why I think he's so, like, we're talking about this getting started routine system. Yeah. And he did get well, started, yeah, then he could do it. My counter to that is never to stop. I write six uh, days a week. See, I don't, I never stop. When do you write? In the morning? I write so, in the morning, yeah. The, the I other, write a couple of hours a day, but I write six days a week. And uh, so I'm not waiting for writer's block or, or, or inspiration. I'm working all the time. But, but that's what I'm talking about when I said you have the luxury to write. You yes. have the luxury to get up in the morning and write the way you want to do it or do things the way you've seen. Uh, and I also have the luxury to struggle to, to find out where my rent's coming from every month. But, <laughs> you, but you know, I, it, it's, you know, I'm committed to this. Uh, I've had, uh, I, I owned a successful business and, and you know, and drank and, and used that up. And so this is a, there's a point in my life now where I've been given the luxury of really doing what I want to do. And, uh, and this is what I love. So it's a, you know, it's a real gift from God, you know. So we have a publisher for our second book. We've got a play that could possibly go off Broadway at any minute. Broadway. Broadway. Sorry, any minute. Off Broadway. Any minute. Any yeah, minute. we've had some offers. <laughs> Boiler Room, I think, is going to go to Broadway. Yeah. And we have a, a writer, Dan Fonte, who's writing every single day. So and we're happy that you were with us oh, today. Thank you, so John. Thank you so much. Thanks yeah. a lot. Appreciate you having I'm me. I'm really glad that you were here. It was thank wonderful you. to be able to meet you. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for watching. Keep riding to uh, 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, and we'll answer your letters as fast as we can. Thanks. We'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles. <laughs>